Hello and welcome back to Practical ACG Courses. It's Obeid once again. Today we will be discussing the Scarborosa criterion. I will explain the underlying concepts and how you can remember the Scarborosa criteria without having to learn it by heart. I will also discuss all the recent updates including the modified Scarborosa criteria and how it compares and contrasts with the original Scarborosa criteria. Before we start, I would like to thank you for your support to my channel. It's only four months old, but it's been actively growing. If you find the content useful, but you have not already subscribed to the channel, can I please request that you subscribe and click on the bell icon as well, so that you do not miss any of the new videos. Also share the videos to, with your colleagues as well. Let's learn and grow together. If you like my style of teaching and would like to be informed about the ECG courses that I conduct, please fill out this form. This will put you on my emailing list and you will be informed whenever I conduct a course. In addition, if you have any topics that you want me to create videos on, you can let me know in that as well. If you have registered for my previous courses and you have opted to receive emails from me regarding future courses, then you need not register on this link. So let's crack on then. So what is Carbosa criteria and why do we need it? This is the ECG of a patient with uncomplicated left bundle branch block. As you can see, it fulfills all the ECG criteria of left bundle branch block like a wide QRS, dominant S wave in V1, broad monophasic R waves in the lateral leads, etc. However, if you look at the ECG carefully, you will notice that most of the ECG findings expected in ischemia like ST elevation, ST depression, T wave inversion, etc. can also be seen in this LBBB ECG. So LBBB can resemble anterior wall MI. When a patient with pre-existing LBBB presents with chest pain, how do you determine which changes are due to the baseline LBBB and which is new due to the MI? This is where the Scarbosa criteria comes in. Scarbosa criteria is a set of three ECG findings which will help diagnose MI in the presence of LBBB. The original criteria was proposed by cardiologist Dr. Elena Scarbosa in 1996. Prior to this, it was widely believed that it was not possible to diagnose MI in the presence of LBBB. The original Scarbosa criteria had a high specificity of around 98%, but a low sensitivity of around 20%. In 2012, Dr. Stephen W. Smith, who is an emergency physician, modified the Scarbosa criteria so that now both the sensitivity and the specificity is in the early 90s. Today, this is the accepted standard for interpreting LBBB ECGs. To understand Scarbosa criteria, we need to understand three underlying concepts. The first concept is regarding what actually happens in LBBB. In a normal heart, once the atria gets depolarized, the impulse in the AV node travels down the bundle of his and into the bundle branches on both sides simultaneously. This results in a simultaneous depolarization of both sides of the ventricle. In a patient with LBBB, there is a block in the left bundle branch. And as a result, the impulse from the AV node cannot travel down in the left bundle branch. The impulse can only travel down the right bundle branch and into the right ventricle, resulting in a depolarization of the right ventricle first. It then sends an impulse across the myocardium slowly into the left ventricle, which results in a slow and abnormal depolarization of the left ventricle. In short, the primary abnormality in left bundle branch block is an abnormal ventricular depolarization. On ECG, the ventricular depolarization is represented by a QRS and so the ECG findings of LBBB should primarily involve the QRS complex like widening of the QRS complex, the deep S wave in V1, the broad monophasic R waves in the lateral leads, etc. Which raises the question, then why are there changes in the ST segment and in the T waves as you can see here? Which brings us to the second concept, that is, repolarization is dependent on depolarization. This is why in LBBB, in addition to the primary abnormalities of the QRS complex, you also see secondary repolarization abnormalities in the ST segment and T waves. 
So how do these STT changes manifest on an LBBB ECG? As a general principle in electrophysiology, the ST segment and the T waves are fair weather friends of the QRS complex. When everything is fine, the ST segment and the T wave stays along with the QRS complex. But when there is some trouble, the ST segment and the T waves runs away in the opposite direction. If you look at this LBBB ECG, you can see that the ST segment is moving away from the direction of the QRS. In V1, the QRS is negative and therefore there is ST segment elevation. In V6, the QRS is positive and therefore there is ST segment depression. This phenomenon in which the ST segment moves away from the direction of the QRS is called discordance. This is simply an ECG manifestation of the second concept that we just discussed that abnormal depolarization leads to abnormal repolarization. So the point to note here is that some degree of discordance is normal in an LBBB ECG. Then what is concordance? It is when ST segment and the QRS are in the same direction. Since you would not expect an abnormal depolarization to be followed by a normal repolarization, you should never see concordance in an uncomplicated LBBB ECG. If you see concordance in an LBBB ECG, it means that there is a second pathological process which is deviating the ST segment in addition to the LBBB and that is usually acute MI or occlusion. And this was the third concept that I wanted to share with you. The concepts underlying concordance and discordance. So what does concordance and discordance look like on ECG? Depending upon the direction of the QRS, there are two ways concordance can manifest on ECG. If the QRS is positive, the ST segment should be elevated. This is referred to as concordant ST elevation. And if the QRS is negative, the ST segment should be depressed. This is referred to as concordant ST depression. Remember, both concordant ST elevation and concordant ST depression should never be seen in an uncomplicated LBBB. When it comes to discordance, again there are two possibilities. You can have discordant ST elevation and discordant ST depression. Because the Scarbosa criteria explicitly mentions only discordant ST elevation, we will be discussing only about discordant ST elevation. In reality, even discordant ST depression can be useful, but that is a discussion for advanced ECG interpreters and so beyond the scope of today's talk. Just remember that because we are looking for acute coronary occlusion or an acute MI, we are mainly bothered only about ST elevation. So what is discordant ST elevation? Discordant ST elevation is when you have a negative QRS, a predominantly negative QRS with an significant ST elevation. As we just discussed, some degree of discordant ST elevation is normally seen in an LBBB. This is referred to by the term appropriate discordance. But excessively discordant ST elevation should also not be seen in LBBB. So how do you define excessive discordance? I will discuss this shortly. Let's quickly summarize the points that we have learned so far. Appropriate discordance is normal in LBBB. If you remember this one point, then you can derive the rest of Scarbosa's criteria. This means that concordance should never be seen in LBBB. So the three ECG findings that should never be seen in LBBB are concordant ST elevation, concordant ST depression, and excessively discordant ST elevation. If any of these are present, it is indicative of an acute MI or occlusion. As you have no doubt guessed by now, these are the three components of Scarbosa criteria. Now let's go a little bit more into the details. How much of ST elevation or ST depression is significant? Even 1 mm of ST segment deviation in a single lead is significant, irrespective of whether it is ST segment elevation or ST segment depression. This is different from the STEMI criteria where you needed to have 1 mm of ST segment elevation in at least two contiguous leads. Now which leads should you look for these ST segment deviations? If you are looking for ST elevation, you can look for it in any lead. Even 1 mm of ST elevation in any single lead is indicative of an acute MI. But in the case of ST depression, things are different. 
Concordant ST depression is looked for only in leads V1 to V3. Why is that so? This is because you are actually looking for posterior wall MI. Remember, posterior wall MI is the only acute MI which presents as ST depression and that too only in leads V1 to V3. If you flip the ECG, you can actually see the posterior wall MI. So in short, ST elevation should be looked for in all leads, but concordant ST depression is significant only if it is present in V1 to V3. Now let's discuss discordant ST elevation. We know that some degree of discordant ST elevation should normally be seen in LBPP, but when does it become excessively discordant? This is where the original and the modified Scarbosa criteria differed in how they defined excessive discordance. In the original Scarbosa criteria, it was defined arbitrarily as an ST elevation of 5 mm or more, which is what led to the low sensitivity of the original criteria. This was later modified by Dr. Smith, who proposed that excessively discordant ST elevation should be defined in relation to the height of the preceding S wave and should not be an arbitrary cutoff value. As per his research, excessively discordant ST elevation is present when the height of the ST elevation is 25% or more of the preceding S wave amplitude. In this example, the height of the ST elevation is 4.5 mm and the S wave amplitude is 60 mm. If you calculate the ST elevation S wave ratio, you get 0.28 which is 28%. And so this is excessively discordant ST elevation. The interesting thing here is that this QRS complex fulfills the criteria for excessive discordance as per the modified Scarbosa criteria, but not as per the original Scarbosa criteria as it is less than 5 mm. To sum it all up, Scarbosa criteria is positive if any one of the following is present. Concordant ST elevation in any lead, concordant ST depression in V1 to V3, or excessively discordant ST elevation which is 25% or more of the preceding S wave in any lead. Remember, the ST segment deviation has to be of only 1 mm and present in only one single lead. If any of these three findings are present on an LBBB ECG of a patient with chest pain, you should understand that there is a second pathological process which is causing further ST deviation from the baseline LBBB changes, and that is acute MI. I hope this explanation helps you remember the Scarbosa criteria without having to resort to rote memorization. There are only two differences between the original and the modified Scarbosa criteria. The first has to do with how they define excessively discordant ST elevation. We have just discussed that. The only other difference is that original Scarbosa criteria is a weighted criteria, whereas modified Scarbosa criteria is an unweighted criteria, which means that if any one of the three criteria is fulfilled, then it becomes Scarbosa positive. The American College of Cardiology guidelines on the evaluation of chest pain in ED now recommends using Smith modified Scarbosa criteria. This was published less than a year ago. Let's practice Scarbosa criteria. Criteria 1 is concordant ST elevation. Though we can look for ST elevation in any lead, concordant ST elevation can only be seen in leads where the QRS is positive. Remember, Concordance means that both the QRS and the ST segment should be going in the same direction. Now, is there any concordant ST elevation in these leads? No. And so, criteria 1 is not fulfilled. For criteria 2, we are looking at discordant ST depression in V1 to V3. There is no ST depression in these three leads. So, criteria 2 is not fulfilled either. Criteria 3 is excessively discordant ST elevation. If you want to see the discordant ST elevation, you need to look at leads where QRS is predominantly negative. Remember, in discordance, QRS and ST segment should be going in opposite direction. Now, in each lead, you need to see if the ST segment is 25% or more than the amplitude of the preceding S wave. In this ECG, all the concordant ST elevation is less than 25%. So, criteria 3 is not fulfilled as well. Since none of the criteria is satisfied, this ECG is Scarbosa negative. Does this ECG fulfill Scarbosa criteria? Concordant ST elevation is present in lead 2, V5 and V6. Even though V5 has concordant ST elevation, it is not significant as per Scarbosa criteria because the ST elevation is less than 1 mm. So criteria 1 is fulfilled only in lead 2 and V6. Concordant ST depression is present in V1, V2 and V3. So criteria 2 is also fulfilled.
Excessively discordant ST elevation is present in lead 3 and AVF. These two leads clearly have discordant ST elevation, which is much more than the 25% of preceding S wave amplitude. In short, this ECG satisfies all the three criteria and therefore is Carbosa positive. And this ECG, does it fulfill Carbosa criteria? There is no concordant ST elevation, neither is there concordant ST depression in V1 to V3. However, there is excessively discordant ST elevation in lead 3 and AVF. In lead 3, it is excessively discordant by around 30%, whereas in AVF, it is excessively discordant by around 37%. There is no other excessive discordance anywhere on the CCG. Since criteria 3 is fulfilled, the CCG is Carbosa positive. But there is something different about the CCG. Even though it looks like an LBBB, it is not LBBB. The biggest clue is the presence of spikes before the QRS complex. This can be seen in most leads, especially the precordial leads. So the spikes tell you that this is actually a paced rhythm. So why does a right ventricular paced rhythm look very similar to an LBBB? This is because the underlying pathophysiology is similar in many ways. In both these conditions, the right ventricle gets depolarized first and then the left ventricles get depolarized slowly and abnormally. As a result, the concepts discussed in LBBB is applicable to right ventricular pace rhythms as well and by extension, Scarboza criteria is applicable to right ventricular pace rhythms as well. When Scarboza criteria is used for RV pace rhythms, concordant ST depression is looked for in leads V1 to V6 and not just V1 to V3. This is because RV pace rhythms tend to have predominantly negative QRSs in V1 to V6. In addition, using V1 to V6 increases the sensitivity of the modified Scarbosa criteria for pace rhythms. As per 2013 AHA guidelines, new onset LBBB is no longer considered a STEMI equivalent and therefore is not an indication for immediate cath lab activation. This is because studies have shown that only 2-4% to of patients with chest pain and new onset LBBB actually have acute coronary occlusion. Let's quickly recap how we can derive this Carbosa criteria. We know that appropriate discordance is a feature of LBBB, which means that the three things we should never see in LBBB are concordant ST elevation, concordant ST depression, and excessively discordant ST elevation, which is now defined as an ST elevation which is 25% or more of the preceding S wave amplitude. ST elevations are looked for in all leads, whereas ST depressions are only looked for in V1 to V3 because we are looking for posterior volume. 1 mm of ST deviation in a single lead is sufficient to fulfill the criteria. That's all for today. I hope you found this video useful. If so, please like, share and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Also, don't forget to click on the bell icon so that you do not miss out on any of my videos. Once again, if you want to be informed about my courses, fill the link that is seen here. I will also leave it in the description box below. Thank you and have a nice day.